Tonight, the United States Senate says our liberal government isn't answering questions about our Syrian migrant plan. Well, I've got five questions maybe the U.S. can get answered for me. It's January 27th, and you're watching The Ezra Levant Show. Why should others go to jail Why? when you're a biggest carbon yeah. consumer I know? There's 8,500 customers here, and you won't give them an answer. You come here once a year with a sign, and you feel morally superior. The only thing I have to say to the government for why I publish it is because it's my bloody right to do so. Important news out of Washington, D.C. The Canadian ambassador has been summoned to a full committee hearing of the U.S. Senate next week to explain Canada's mad rush to jam in as many Muslim migrants from Syria as quickly as possible without a proper vetting. Here, take a look at the official title of the Senate hearings, quote, Canada's fast-track refugee plan, unanswered questions and implications for U.S. national security, unquote. Isn't that funny? There are unanswered questions. But our own timid Canadian parliament has not properly asked them. Even conservative MPs have not properly grilled the immigration minister on his risky scheme. Our media is the farthest thing from skeptical. They literally participate in cheerleading PR efforts for these migrants. And the government's access to information bureaucrats, they have been instructed to delay responding to any questions for up to 300 days. Seriously, I will prove that to you in a moment by showing you the questions they have refused to answer filed by us. Now, all that's a shame on Canada. Our system is broken. But put yourself in America's shoes just for a moment. The United States sees that we've opened up the floodgates to Syria, a lawless, chaotic, corrupt territory festering with a dozen Muslim terrorist groups, no rule of law, no reliable documents. In fact, where the Islamic State has seized inventories of Syrian passports and can thus print them at will. Yeah, the U.S. is worried about us because watching John McCallum, our immigration minister, and his clownish daily conduct on this file is not reassuring. And the U.S. shares the world's longest undefended border with us. So yeah, the Americans are worried. And add to that... Trudeau's threat to abandon the anti-terrorist coalition of the Allies and Trudeau's promise to repeal the law that would strip convicted dual citizen terrorists of their Canadian citizenship. Yeah, I mean, the liberal scheme for Muslim migrants, it changes every week. What John McCallum says will happen doesn't happen. He can't answer key questions. Even pro-refugee community workers are saying he has no clue, he has no plan, they can't handle the flood of people, they're unprepared, as are the migrants themselves. We hear news of severely ill Syrian migrants being brought over with highly communicable diseases. Why did they do that? And the weirdest part is that the Trudeau policy officially refuses to bring in true victims, Christian Arabs, Yazidis, Kurds, the people being devoured and killed over there. Here, listen to Trudeau himself say that he absolutely refuses to give priority to the actual victims. Whether a liberal government would prioritize ethnic and religious minorities. Absolutely not. Oh, okay. Well, now that's Canada's problem, isn't it? But we share a border, so it's an American problem too. And they're rightly asking, what risks are McCallum and Trudeau exposing Americans to? And why won't the Liberals answer basic questions? It's a real threat. I mean, just for example, the so-called Millennium Bomber, Ahmed Rassam, he was an Al-Qaeda terrorist who came through Canada as a Muslim migrant and drove across the border on his way to blow up the L.A. airport. Luckily, he was caught by an alert U.S. border cop. Then there's the Via Rail terrorists, Chihab Esagayer and Raya Jasser, two more Al-Qaeda terrorists who came to Canada as Muslim migrants, who wanted to blow up a train between New York and Toronto. So, two close calls. Say, so what do you think the United States would do one day if, God forbid, the next Muslim migrant using Canada as a base of operations succeeds and blows something up in the United States? How long do you think our border would remain undefended? Imagine the searches of people and vehicles and documents 
that would come through as a result of that. Uh, the potential victims at the LA airport and on those via rail trains are extremely lucky our police did the job. But the rest of us who like our easy travel and trade with the United States, we're extremely lucky too. But luck only lasts for so long. You know, you know, this is like the Aesop's fable of the ant and the grasshopper. You know the short story. A grasshopper plays and dances and sings all summer laughing at the ants who were busy working, storing food for the winter. When winter comes, the grasshopper has no food and begs for some from the ants who tell him, sorry, why don't you just keep on singing and dancing? That's pretty much Canada and the United States now when it comes to Muslim migrants and terrorism and national security. Nothing sums that up more than last week when Justin Trudeau was hobnobbing with Hollywood celebrities at Davos, Switzerland, taking selfies, throwing parties, but Canada was not invited to a meeting of NATO allies because we're not regarded as serious anymore. The United States Secretary of Defense, Ashton Carter, he basically called us lazy grasshoppers here. We're prepared to do a lot, uh, but uh, you know, when they're defeated, we'll remember who helped. You see, he was actually at Davos too, but Trudeau was too busy meeting with Hollywood actors to meet with him. What a perfect metaphor. Trudeau goes to Switzerland to party and drink. The United States sends its defense secretary to talk about war. Trudeau and McCallum have no clue about vetting migrants. And Canada is so unserious as a parliamentary democracy and as a media culture that our establishment doesn't care. So it's up to the United States Senate to ask the questions that our own political media complex won't. We are lazy, party boy grasshoppers. The ants, the grown-ups, we don't have a lot of them in Canada. So what are these questions about migrants that I'm talking about? What questions haven't been asked, let alone answered in Canada? What questions might the U.S. Senate find out for us since they're still run by grown-ups? Well, I've got a list of them. These are access to information requests that we have filed here at The Rebel with the federal government. There are simple questions, very simple, easy to answer. But every single one of them has been stonewalled by the liberals who refuse to answer, deny there are answers, or say they need 300 more days to answer, by which time all of this year's Muslim migrants will be here already. Take a look at this. So remember when the liberals took their media pets with them on a tightly controlled, scripted, PR trip to Jordan to watch the processing of Muslim migrants. You can see a room with people being asked questions. Now, the media party has no curiosity about security or terrorism, so nobody in the official liberal media tour bothered to ask, well, what are these potential migrants being quizzed on? What, what questions are they being asked? So we did. We, we did something very simple. We wrote one question to the Department of Immigration, quote, requesting a copy of the questionnaire used for interviews with potential Syrian refugees seeking to come to Canada, unquote. Can we please see the questions they're being asked? And the re reply we got back, as you can see, is just incredible. Quote, following a thorough search of our information holdings, I regret to inform you that no records were found that respond to your request. Say what? We saw questions being asked, and people entering information into a computer. Government officials talk about forms and questions with these refugees. They're not just refusing to give us this information. They're refusing to even acknowledge it exists. Oh, and who are you going to believe, the Liberal Party or your lying eyes? Could you imagine the media party uproar if such a bald-faced lie we're told when Stephen Harper was the one accused of running a secretive government muzzling bureaucrats. But I'm not interested in other journalists and their hypocrisy today. I'm interested in actually finding out what questions we're asking these Muslim migrants. Now, we have appealed this stonewalling to the Access to Information Office, and I'll tell you how that goes. But you've got to think, why would the liberals do this? If they were confident in their questionnaire, why wouldn't they show it to the world, to their own citizens? If they were proud of it, if it were sufficient, wouldn't they disclose it? I mean, they must disclose it under access to information law, whether it's flattering to them or not. But the fact that they have chosen to flout the law couldn't be clearer. They know the answer is surely embarrassing. 
but they also know the media party won't call them on it. Hey, maybe the U.S. Senate can get an answer for us Canadians. I want to show you four more access to information requests that the Liberals are stonewalling that we have submitted. Here's a good one. Remember, Canada is not choosing the refugees who apply. That has been delegated either to the United Nations or to the Turkish government, both of whom have a strong Islamist agenda, neither of whom particularly cares about Canadian security. But who knows? Maybe the Turks flagged someone. So here's our question. We asked, quote, provide copies of any documents, including emails, memos, reports, etc., regarding any concerns raised about the list of refugees being provided by the Turkish government to Canada for potential refugees to bring to Canada. So Turkey is selecting our refugees, which is sort of bizarre that we've handed over our immigration system to a foreign government run by a Muslim Brotherhood extremist. But the Canadian government is the one acting like dictators here, aren't they? I mean, read their reply to us. Despite our best efforts to process your request within the 30-day statutory limit, an extension of up to 300 days is required. Pardon? You need almost one year to hand over the document? Why? Other than political embarrassment, why else? Oh, but they do say this, quote, The department is working to meet the mandate on Syrian refugees set by the prime minister. Okay, great, but what does that have to do with access to information requests? which are governed by a law and have special staff dedicated just to them. We're not asking frontline immigration officers to stop what they're doing and do photocopying for us here. We're asking the access to information staff to do their access to information job and follow the access to information law. And they're basically saying, no, Trudeau told us not to talk to you for 300 days. In a way, they're being honest, aren't they? A, a few more. Remember when Trudeau had his big photo op with Muslim migrants at Pearson Airport in Toronto, lots of cameras and scripted PR moments with the media party lovingly detailing it all. I mean, the front page of the Toronto Star literally had an Arabic headline that day. They were so erotic about the whole moment. But one government official told us confidentially that more than 20 of those Muslim migrants who landed at Pearson had been isolated and detained at the airport. Boy, that sounded odd, but we didn't want to run with just that rumor. So we asked the government about it. We asked for, quote, copies of any documents regarding any security or health concerns for any of the group of refugees who arrived in Toronto and were met by dignities, uh, dignitaries, including the Prime Minister on December 10th. Well, no, the government refused. They demanded another 300 days to answer that question. Really? Well, just tell us if it's true and tell us how many were sequestered and what for. You don't need 300 days for that unless the truth is awful and you don't want people to know about it for another year. Okay, well, how about this one? Here's a pretty basic question about refugees. The true definition of refugees, vulnerable people at risk of violence and danger. So we requested from the government, quote, all documents regarding how the government identifies the most vulnerable Syrian refugees and how they are selected to come to Canada. And look, given that all these searches are done electronically now, we wrote, Possible keywords for searches include religious minorities, ethnic minorities, LBGT, Christian, Yazidi, Kurd, etc. Just to show what we were after. And they said no. They just refused. They demanded a 300-day delay. They say they're too busy helping refugees, but that's a lie. Again, the access to information staff isn't out helping refugees. They're, they're sitting in an office in Ottawa or Hull at their computers, and their job, according to the law, is to disclose government information that is not exempted for reasons of individual privacy or cabinet confidences or things like that. Asking how they select vulnerable refugees does not fall under an exemption. It falls under political interference. They're obviously embarrassed by what they're doing, and they want to delay the bad news for 300 days. Okay, one last one. And you can see uh, that Trudeau has ordered his staff muzzled. I mean, they pretty much say as much, don't they? I've heard from Canadian Armed Forces sources that the Department of Defense is building a mosque at military bases, in, in particular at CFB Valcartier in Quebec. Building a mosque for Muslim migrants. Just stop to think about that. We've announced that we're going to quit the military coalition to stop the Islamic State terrorists overseas. And instead, we're going to use our military budget from taxpayers' dollars to build mosques on public property. Isn't that incredible? If it's true, 
Well, why don't we find out if it's true instead of just running the rumor that we hear from soldiers? So we asked for records, quote, regarding efforts to meet the religious needs of Syrian refugees who are being brought to Canada since November 4, 2015. Are they, in fact, building mosques? Are they hiring imams? Are they buying Korans? I hear reports almost every day about what Canadian soldiers are being told to do. But let's find out the facts. Well, are you kidding? They don't refuse. They, I mean, just, they just not even give that. So they don't even refuse to disclose that. They just say, we'll get back to you in, quote, 275 days. This is illegal, of course. It's against the law. The Access to Information Act. Because, look, that law was only meant to restrict Stephen Harper, right? To show Harper's political chicanery. To expose the most secretive micromanaging prime minister ever. To quote a dozen media party editorials from memory about Stephen Harper. Oh, but Justin Trudeau, our sweet prince, bringing in Syrian migrants by the tens of thousands. No, no, no. He doesn't have to answer. Or if he does, he can delay it by a year because he's a liberal. And the media agree with him on Muslim migrants. You see a pattern here? Basic questions, not trick questions. Basic accountability. What are you asking Muslim migrants to screen them? How are you vetting them? What has Turkey told you about the people they're choosing? What have other people told you about those Turkish selections? How are you choosing vulnerable minorities to protect them? Or are you even trying to do that? What about that tip that we got that 20 or so migrants who about being quarantined at Pearson Airport. Was that true? If so, what was wrong with that? Is it true that the government is using tax dollars to build mosques, including at Canadian forces bases? These are basic questions. These are fair questions. Not one of them has been answered. Most of them have been delayed 300 days. So yeah, back to how I started this show today. Canada's media, they don't mind this. Canada's parliament doesn't seem to mind much either. But the United States, the grown-ups, the ants working hard to keep us safe while our little grasshopper prince parties in Davos, well, the U.S. Senate seems to mind. They are holding hearings about Canada's unanswered questions. That should be humiliating to Canada's media and parliament, but it's not. Canada's back, as the liberals say. Yeah, back at the kids' table. We have a selfie prince who parties with Hollywood stars while the grown-ups in the U.S. Senate Ask the real questions. Hey, one last document that we did actually manage to get a response back from the government. It's a letter from the Liberal Public Safety Minister, Ralph Goodale, written to his U.S. counterpart, Jay Johnson, back in November. Johnson was asking Goodale about Canada's plans on a Friday, as it so happened. So by Tuesday morning, barely three days later, Goodale got right back to Johnson, promising him an immediate, quote, technical briefing with detailed information regarding our process and plans. Isn't that funny? Ralph Goodale and John McCallum and Justin Trudeau won't tell Canadians the details of their plans. They stonewall. They deny basic documents even exist or tell mere Canadian citizens to wait 300 days. But the United States asks questions and Goodale answers a foreign country immediately. Canadians well, they can shut up and sit in ignorance. It is a deep embarrassment that the United States is having hearings about our broken refugee system, but it's clear they care more about security than we do. And they care more about government transparency and honesty, too. I'm looking forward to that Senate hearing, but what a disgrace that we have to look to a foreign government to find out about the workings of our own government. Hey, before you go... Can you sign our petition at www.refugeepause.ca? I mean, this is madness. It's not a plan. It's chaos. It's risky. Tell John McCallum, just stop. Go to refugeepause.ca. Stay with us for more. I love Alberta. I've lived here my whole life and I'm proud of it. I'm proud of our free market, pro-business, low-tax, do-it-yourself attitude. And now, I'm watching my province get destroyed. We've all had hints of the NDP's radical views in the past, 
but no one actually thought they'd ever run this province. Not even them. And now they are. And the worst is yet to come. I give my sad forecast for Alberta in my new ebook, The Destroyers, Rachel Notley and the NDP's War on Alberta. Go to thedestroyers.ca to sign up for your free copy today. Welcome back. Well, Canada is one of the most harmonious places in the world, but that is changing as hundreds of thousands of Muslim migrants come here, not just the Syrians, but others who have come here over the past 10, 15 years from places that are deeply anti-Semitic. And they bring with them not just anti-Western antipathy, but a special hatred for the Jews. That's manifesting itself now in Canadian institutions, including York University, traditionally one of the more Jewish universities in Canada. Here, take a look at this footage we filmed of a giant mural on the university campus of a Palestinian rioter holding a rock as he looks at an Israeli vehicle. And he's, and he's clearly about to throw the rock as a rioter. He has the Palestinian kafia on. He shows that he's interested in all of Israel to become Palestine. You can see his little sash. And he's about to commit a murder. This is not some poster. This is not some pamphlet. This is an enormous piece of artwork permanently installed on the wall of York University. And joining me now in studio to talk about this is Willem Hart, a student with Hasbara in York. That's a Hebrew word which basically means we are going to be pro-Israel. We're not going to go silently to the slaughter as Jews did 75 years ago. Is that what, what does Hasbara actually mean? Well, literally in Hebrew, Hasbara lehasbira means to explain. Uh, the word's kind of refashioned and interpreted to mean uh, diplomacy or explanation, you know, try to create a dialogue, which is what our purpose is on campus. So you're fighting against anti-Semitism, really? For sure. And where exactly on campus is this mural? And it looks huge. Is it what, like 20 feet by 10 feet kind of thing? Uh, no, it's about uh, 10 feet by uh, 5 feet or so. So it's, it's life size, really? It's fairly big. It's fairly noticeable. And what building is it in? This is in the York University Student Center. So this is uh, affixed to the wall, obviously by the approval of the Students' Union, I Yes, presume? exactly. It's by the York Federation of Students, the YFS. Uh, I, there's no other way to to think about this other than a rock-throwing, violent, uh, violent protest, rioter, and, and these rocks that killed Jews, not just Israeli soldiers, but civilian men and women. This is part of the Intifada. This is, a, this is an image that promotes violence. This is, it's not even a picture of a rioter. It's actually a kind of a peaceful scene. It's a kind of romanticization of the rock-throwing that habitually leaves Israelis dead, children and adults alike. Yeah. And I think that's the very clever propaganda effect of it, is to normalize this. Oh yeah, that's normal. Oh yeah, in fact, he's the hero. Look at those sculpted arms. He, he looks, uh, you know, we don't know who this romantic, mysterious man is. The head but, is cut off. Yeah, but we're, we're with him, and this is normal. And it, it not only telegraphs to new arrivals to Canada from anti-Semitic countries like Syria and, and Egypt and others, it not only telegraphs to them we're anti-Semitic here too, we hate Israel here too, but it erodes the peaceful and, and uh, uh, liberal notions that old stock Canadians have, which is we don't hate Jews. We don't solve problems by throwing rocks. It's, it's such a powerful piece of propaganda. How long has it been up on the wall? Uh, the mural was installed uh, in 2013, but uh, just to comment on that, anti-Semitism and especially anti-Israelism and you know, its new form, it's supported by a variety of people at York from different walks of life. Uh, you know, people that maybe you would call old stock Canadians who are... On the far know, left, right? They, they, yes, the far left is where it comes from. That's where anti-Zionism has situated itself, you know. It's a currently. marriage. The far left, yes. you know, socialists who are secular mm -hmm. with also Islamic fundamentalists. It's a bizarre coalition, really, of people, I mean, it's on the Islamic side, they hate gays, they hate women, they hate uh, the separation of mosque and state, but they team up with secular, atheist, postmodernist, 
uh, feminists and, and even gay activists, which is so surprising to me, because if you're gay mm -hmm. in, in an Islamic uh, uh, territory, you're, you're stoned to death. Yes, it's, it's bizarre that all the things that the left supports, that purports to support, yeah. are just thrown in the wayside in these societies. I appreciate your correction. It, it's not just Muslim immigrants here. Of course not. It's, it's the hard left, which briefly had pity for the Jews after the Holocaust. The honeymoon period. Yeah, when Israel was started as sort of a socialist country, but they despise Israel because it's successful and free. Um, now, there's some interesting news, is that a senior Jewish benefactor, a philanthropist, uh, what's his name, Paul Bronfman? Paul Bronfman, yes. And tell me who he is, what he had been doing with uh, York University, and what news came this past week. So Mr. Bronfman, he's a well-known uh, media mogul that they're calling him in the news. Uh, he, um, he was uh, a benefactor to York, uh, specifically the art and multimedia department. Uh, from what I understand, York was given camera equipment and all this other multimedia equipment for the studies. And he said uh, last week, I believe on Friday, um, if the mural is not down by the end of the day, I'm withdrawing my funding. And that's what he said. And here we are on Wednesday, and the mural is still up there in the student center. Yeah. You know, as I mentioned before, York used to be a very Jewish university. Mm -hmm. And if you look at their alumni and donors page, mm -hmm. It's almost 100% Jewish. If you look at the senior givers, people giving half a million, quarter million, a million dollars or more, it, it's so bizarre to me that institutions built on tolerance and peace and frankly with Jewish charity mm -hmm. are now being hijacked and turned into anti-Semitic weapons. I'm, I'm glad that Paul Bronfman has the self-respect to stop funding people who, who uh, sanctify anti-Semitic writers. Where are the rest of the Jews? Where are the official Jews? Or as Israel Asper used to call them, the Jews of silence. Shh, don't make a fuss. Um, first of all, I really, I agree with you. I think Mr. Bronfman did absolutely the right thing by pulling his money. If it's his money, if he chooses that York University is not an institution that's worthy of his support any longer than, and it is his right to withdraw it. Um, you know, there are Jews fighting. As I said, I'm from Husbar, York. We are on, we're the students on the front lines. We are you know, advocating for Israel. We are educating the rest of the student body about Israel and anti-Semitism and about the geopolitical conflict, the Israeli-Arab conflict. Uh, we're the ones there. We have uh, support from, you know, various community activists. But, you know, before we can go forward uh, with the general community, there has to be a consensus about what to do and an understanding that this is anti-Semitism. Well, I don't think you need to wait for the most weak need unmotivated person for you to act. And I think that's, you're with Hasbro. There's other Jewish groups that are more timid on campus. Um, here's the thing. It, 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 if this picture were a Ku Klux Klan mm -hmm. uh, grand dragon about to torch a black church, <laughs> or if it was, you know, any other scene that showed an act of violence mm -hmm. about to happen... South African apartheid, if it was, if there was any other, if it was Nazism, if there was any other odious act that was shown in a romantic way like that, it would be taken down immediately. No, it wouldn't, because it never would have been put up there in the first place. That's a good point. You're so right. And now, that's why this is anti-Semitism. You know, the president of York University, the first Muslim university president in Canada, Mamdo Shokri, I'm tempted to say he's giving this a pass because he himself is Muslim, but in fairness to him, I think many universities, whether their president is Jewish, Christian, or Muslim, this is the new normal on North American university campuses. They have been colonized by a combination of the radical left, which hates the establishment no matter what, mm -hmm. and Muslims who have teamed up to bring the Jew hatred from overseas home. Well, in terms of... Um the president of York, I don't think his background really has anything to do with it because, as you said, at other universities you have, um, you have administration you know, from the general Canadian public who have given this a pass all across the board who don't have the moral authority to say this is wrong and we're going to do something about Why it. Why do you mean they don't have the moral authority? Why don't they have, uh, they don't have the moral uh, integrity, I mean. This mural is being defended. This mural is being defended by people who want to say that this is art. I just want to say that this is not art. This is not freedom of expression. This mural, and there needs to be unanimity, and there needs to be a consensus across the board of what this mural is and isn't. This is not art. This is not freedom of expression. This is not a conversation starter about the conflict. 
this is the product of a person whose mind is so twisted, he sees fit to glorify the terrorists who without pause would smash a boulder into the face of a baby, such as Adele Baton in 2013, she was a baby. They smashed a rock into her face, threw it at her car as it, as it was going by on a hilltop, just like in the mural. And it's okay to do that. It's okay to smash a rock into the face of a baby as long as that baby is a Jew. And that's what this mural yeah. represents. Well, my point is that they would never allow this for any other Ever. group other Ever. than the Jews. Well, nice to meet you. Stay with us, folks. After these words, we'll talk to Paige McPherson about the shenanigans in Calgary and their rising taxes. Stay with us. Looking for the perfect gift? Did you know the rebel.media has a store? Make a statement with a t-shirt. Have your morning coffee in a fearless travel coffee mug. There's even an Ezra Levant bobblehead. It's a one-stop shop for the perfect gift. And don't forget to pick up something for yourself. Go to the rebel.media slash store to find out more. Ontario residents are being hosed on electricity prices. The latest Auditor General's report says we've been overcharged by $37 billion over the last several years. That works out to nearly $2,800 for every man, woman and child. Why? Mismanagement and bad policy choices from the Ontario Liberals. It's going to cost us billions more in coming years. Energy Minister Bob Shirelli won't take responsibility. He's lashing out. It's time for Bob to go. If you agree, go to firebob.ca. That's firebob.ca and make your voice heard. And welcome back. Well, a study that will shock absolutely no one in the city of Calgary, their tax rate has skyrocketed under their left-wing mayor, Nahid Nenshi. Joining us now to talk about this is our friend Paige McPherson, the president of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation in Alberta. Hey, great to see you again, Paige. It is no surprise that Nahid Nenshi has, is a big spender. But I think Calgarians will be shocked at just how much of a big taxer he is. Am I right? Yeah, that's right. Especially when you take taxes and fees into consideration, because of course, um, when you're looking at the total of what taxpayers will pay at the municipal level, fees are a really big part of that. So we our our study that we just released, uh, the authors Mark Milky, we looked at taxes and fees in Calgary over the past ten years between 2005 2015, and we found that actually taxes and fees combined have outpaced inflation, as in they've grown higher, even faster than inflation uh, by about three times. Um, so so basically, people are paying a, a lot more in taxes and fees, um, not, not really linked to any sort of uh, normal indicator of economic growth. Their taxes and fees have just gone up quite a bit. So I just want to make crystal clear. So not only has it gone up faster than the population growth, it's gone up faster than population growth and inflation growth times three, because you're talking per person, right? Yeah, so we're talking about basically the rate of, uh, of how much uh, property taxes and fees have increased versus the consumer price index, which is sort of, it's basically uh, used to calculate inflation. So we're comparing it to inflation as the, as the metric there. And, and what we found is that so not only have uh, property taxes just at the municipal level and fees uh, outpaced inflation by about three times, but some fees are up as much as 181% in that time. And when you compare uh, inflation you know, the growth of the economy versus the growth at which taxes and fees are increasing, uh, you'll see that there's a pretty stark difference there and that taxpayers are, are ba bearing a very heavy burden in the city of Calgary. Yeah, it's incredible. You know, I've been reading about stories lately. Uh, I mean, Nenshi is still spending like oil is a hundred bucks a barrel in the city's awash in cash. Besides the, you know, extreme art that he's, you know, he had this whole lit up, sewage treatment plan like i can't remember the dollar amount it was close to a million bucks for like designing art on a sewage treatment plant i understand that he's proposed a multi-million dollar pedestrian strategy i didn't know you needed a strategy to be a pedestrian but when money's no object you do he's still living like it's uh you know hundred dollar oil he has not cut one cent has he 
Well, no, I mean, when you're looking at the, the city spending, they're still increasing projects like that. So yeah, the, the poop palace, that light up sewage uh, treatment wastewater lift station. Um, so that was uh, about a quarter of a million bucks. Quarter then a million you had, bucks, yeah. Um, they're looking at our other art projects. You know, I saw the city uh, recently put out something about uh, a you know illuminated pathway in downtown Calgary. These are the kinds of things that you can absolutely cut back on when the economy is struggling. And but unfortunately, what we see is is the city asking for more uh, tax power. So right now, today, um, Mayor Nenshi as well as uh, Mayor Iveson have have just come out of talks um, in the in the last couple of days with uh, with cabinet uh, in at the legislature. And what they're discussing uh, is city charters. Now, what do city charters mean for the average taxpayer? It means the potential to have new tax powers. It happened in Toronto, where you are, and, and it can happen here in Calgary. Basically, the city of Calgary is right now looking over what would a sales tax do for our revenues? What would a gas tax do for our revenues? And looking into if they brought these things in, you know, how much revenue could that generate? Well, why are they looking into tax powers that they have no jurisdiction over? The province would need to give them those powers. And that's exactly what they're meeting uh, in cabinet about um, over the past couple of days. So why this matters is because, you know, they're crying uh, poor, saying they don't have the revenue sources. And really that revenue problem argument is hard to make when you look at the numbers in this report, because it shows that they've, they've continued to increase taxes and fees, far outpacing inflation. Um, so they, they don't really have a revenue problem. Uh, you know, I think they need to look at the other side of the equation, which is, of course, cost controlling if they want to give any relief to taxpayers. Yeah. Well, I saw Nahid Nenshi was jet setting and hobnobbing in Davos, Switzerland. He's still living like it's fat times in Calgary. Seriously, while Unemployment is skyrocketing, the price of oil plummeting, a carbon tax is coming. He thinks the best use of his time and money as mayor is to jet to a ski hill in Switzerland because Bono is there and Kevin Spacey is there. It's just gross. And, you know, I, I, Calgary's weird, Paige, because it always votes for liberal mayors. I mean, even Ralph Klein was a liberal when he was a mayor, Al Dewar. David Braun Kanye and now Nahid Nenshi. That's fine when the city is so rich, it's got stupid money. It's got more money than brains, so to speak. And I say this as a Calgary boy. I mean, when you got that much money, it doesn't matter who your mayor is. But when times are tough to have someone still spending like a drunken sailor, no insult to sailors, it's time to rein it in. Last word to you, Paige. Do you think Rachel Notley is going to give new taxing powers to the left-wing mayors of Calgary or Edmonton, I think the answer is a no-brainer. Obviously, she is. What do you think she's going to do? Or do you think she wants to have all the money herself so she can take all the dough and get credit for spending it? <laughs> well, um, I think that actually it gives the province a bit of an out if they give more tax powers to the cities. Then they can say, okay, well, we're not raising your taxes as much. We promise not to put in a sales tax. Oh, but maybe the city can put in a sales tax now. It was basically in the NDP platform that they uh, want to give more revenue tools uh, to the cities. And, uh, and that's unfortunate because, you know, I think that they should look at the fact that the councils in Edmonton and Calgary all got salary increases on January 1st. Not a lot of people in those cities saw that outside of that sector. So maybe they should take that into account before they consider even putting another gas tax or a sales tax on Calgarians or Edmontonians. Isn't that incredible? They gave themselves a pay raise in the middle of this oil and gas recession. Disgraceful. It's automatic. It just happens. <laughs> yeah, unbelievable. You know, uh, in a city of 1.1 million people, the most conservative city in Canada, it's a bit embarrassing that this is the government, federally, provincially, municipally. You know what? Voters get the politicians they deserve. It's just a shame no one has stepped up to fight this. Well, Paige, I guess it falls to folks like you and us to do that. Great talking to you today. You keep up the fight at the Taxpayers Federation. We'll do our best on this side over here. Thank you so much. Thanks, my friend. Stay with us. So much more after these words. So open-minded that the brains have fallen out. What's the point that you're making? The point that I'm making is that if you're going to propose a massive overhaul to the way the economy is, is developed in terms of carbon tax, cap and trade, other forms like that, it helps to have some science that is in fact settled. We've heard you loud and clear. You can't get enough Canadian Conservative news and opinion. 
why not check out our blog? It's all your favorite conservative bloggers together on a page called The Megaphone. Go to the rebel.media slash The Megaphone or click on the Megaphone menu from our main page to check it out. Welcome back. Lots of feedback on our campaign yesterday to push back against Denis Coderre, Justin Trudeau, and other Quebec liberals who want to block the Energy East oil pipeline from the West to New Brunswick, but who insist that they should still get equalization payments from the West. Yeah, no. So we started a campaign called CutThemOff.ca and a French version called Rien de Blue. Point C.A. That's French. Anyhow, radio ads, an opinion poll, a petition, and a great billboard, all français, that is going to go up right near Montreal City Hall. In French, of course. Here's some feedback we got on that campaign. Joanne Marcotte writes from Quebec and says, By the way, Ezra, Quebec does not receive $21 billion in equalization, but rather around $10 billion. Thanks, Joanne. You are correct. In yesterday's video and in an email I sent out, I accidentally said uh, the wrong phrase. I said equalization in payments and transfer payments. I got uh, the mix. As you can see from this chart here, Quebec does receive $21 billion a year in transfer payments, of which $10 billion are called equalization payments. So I'm sorry for the terminological inexactitude. I will be more careful with that. Thanks for correcting me. Brian writes in and says, change his name to Denny Cold Air. Well, actually, Denny Hot Air. Denny Cold Air, Denny Hot Air, I get it. He's the worst. I mean, true story. Can I tell you a true story about Denny Cold Air? When he was a liberal MP, I appeared before the House of Commons Natural Resources Committee to answer questions about my book, Ethical Oil, The Case for Canada's Oil Sands. So Cold Air was there as the Liberal Party's energy critic. So supposedly his party's top expert on oil and gas. Now, after this committee meeting, I walked over and shook his hand and gave him a signed copy of my book. It was friendly. And I mentioned that his city of Montreal was the city in Canada that imported the most conflict oil in the whole country from OPEC countries like Saudi Arabia and Algeria. Coming up to Montreal from the Portland to Montreal pipeline. He said, no, 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 no. That pipeline brings in oil from Maine, as in he thought that the state of Maine had <laughs> massive oil fields, and it was sort of like the Ben and Jerry's New England oil or something, like ethical, you know, fair trade oil from Maine. He thought that, instead of that it was just a port where all these OPEC tankers would dock in Portland, Maine, and dump their conflict oil, and that would be pumped up to Montreal on the pipeline. Now, was he really that stupid? Or was it a selective, purposeful ignorance, a lie he told himself so he could hold himself out as morally superior to Albertans and pretend he wasn't buying Saudi oil? So, yeah, Denis Hot Air, I think that's a good one. Now, Barry writes and says, so are you saying ship oil from Alberta and forget the oil in Newfoundland, or am I missing something? Well, listen, I support Newfoundland oil, of course. That is indeed a source of ethical oil. It's from Canada, of course. It's from the East Coast. And yes, of course we should use it. But Canada imports OPEC oil as well. Of course I support Newfoundland oil, but that is not enough oil to fill the St. John refinery, though, is it? I mean, Energy East will bring 1 million barrels per day from Alberta. All of Newfoundland's production combined is about 200,000 barrels per day. So it's not enough. We need both. Alan writes, I read your blog on Miss Trudeau. And it was you that made me sick, not her. Hi, Alan. I guess I should start by telling you I don't have a blog. Uh, and I also did not do a video about Sophie Trudeau. If it was about her awful singing, that was my friend Gavin McInnes. It was about her. If, on the other hand, you're talking about her super gross video with her joking for five minutes about drinking her own menstrual fluid. That was Sheila Gunn-Reed who did that super gross report. So I'm going to take your uh, issue with your grasp of the world around you, Alan. So I'm not sure how I made you sick and Trudeau's super gross comedy sketch didn't, but hey, free country, shakun asongu, I guess. Just don't invite me over for iced tea, okay? 
Well, that's our show for today. What do you think about all the stonewalling from these basic access to information requests that we've been filing with the Liberal government for months now? Can you send us your questionnaire? No, 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 we don't have it. You don't have it? Can we ask you about uh, various refugees, how they're selected, or have you detained any? No, 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 we can't answer that for 300 days. They're stonewalling. It's incredible. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing that our own media doesn't care, that our opposition isn't properly holding them to account. And it's doubly embarrassing that a foreign country is having more transparent inquiries into our security than we do for ourselves. That's shocking. Hey, let me remind you about our big campaign, cutthemoff.ca. We are crowdfunding the billboard that we showed you. We're going to put that up in downtown Montreal. We're going to run radio ads in Saskatchewan, Alberta, and we're going to run radio ads in New Brunswick too. We're going to put the pressure on these folks to say, look, if you don't want oil, then you know what? No equalization payments for you. So go to cutthemoff.ca to learn more. That's it for me today. Thanks for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the show. And until tomorrow, keep fighting for freedom.